Craig Johnson has given us the talent bomb. This is a movie full of so much directing and acting talent that it's a can't-miss proposition, yet it sucks anyway. My son, my son, what have you done? Big time talent bomb. Well, I present to you The Talent Grenade. This is a movie that's full of acting and directing talent, and it's a can't-miss proposition, but for some reason it flops and nobody notices it. An example of this I can think of is 2006's Slither. That's got James Gunn directing, Nathan Fillion, Elizabeth Banks, Michael Rooker, and Jenna Fisher as a switchboard operator. Pam. It really didn't do anything in, in the box office, but it's a great movie, and it's a really good story. You know what might be one of the biggest selling grenades? What? Princess Bride. Oh, yeah. The 80s is filled with talent grenades because of cable. 80s are filled. No, the 80s is a singular. The 80s are filled. The years of the 80s are filled. De decade. The 80s decade... Is filled. Are filled. No, because the 80s are 10 years. No, the 80s is one decade. The years the of the 80s, 80s are filled. 80s are filled. I say we take them both. Shrunk and White would approve. Shrunk and White would approve. <laughs> Why, we happen to have a copy of Strunk and White right here. I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm going to spring one on you. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to the basement. Here on the show, we're currently celebrating cinematic genres. Craig has been picking them at random from these sealed envelopes, and last time he picked film noir. There are many settings that make up the murky underworld of the noir landscape. One of them, the boxing ring. This sweaty, two-fisted world of big dreams and even bigger risks is the perfect black-and-white playground for unscrupulous thugs, treacherous dames, and doomed losers. How fitting that tonight's film should take place in such a world. The world of an over-the-hill boxer making one last desperate grab at the championship. This film stars Sterling Hayden lookalike Robert Ryan, and it is not the movie I've just been describing to you. I've been lying to you the whole time. Stop messing with my mind, Matt. I'm sorry, Craig. I pulled a crisscross. Oh, well, you've uh, you found one. You beat the band here. I don't know this movie at all. I have beat myself here because <laughs> that, that <laughs> didn't come out right. The reason we haven't watched film noir on this show yet is because I've seen most of them. I'm a noir. Fa I'm a noir fanatic, and to tell you the truth, I'm not 100% positive I haven't seen this one. Oh well, <laughs> I'm just pretty sure I haven't. Released in 1949 and having nothing to do with the backwards-dressing 80s rap duo, Criss Cross was directed by noir stalwart Robert Siodmak, who directed such classics as The Killers and Cry of the City. This film stars Bert J.J. Hunsucker Lancaster and Yvonne Lily Munster DiCarlo, who also starred together in the 1947 Jules Dessin film Brute Force. This film also features an uncredited appearance by a very young Tony Curtis. Let's see if we can spot him, shall we? He'll be the swarthy looking one who says, Yonder lies the castle of my father. <laughs> <laughs> Criss Cross was remade in 1995 as The Underneath and directed by Steven Soderbergh. I suppose you want a gift for me, eh, you mug? Yeah, I think I got it coming. The only gift you're gonna get from me is a slug from a 45. <laughs> It's a slug from a 45. That is uh, made entirely of copper. Could I use it as a bullet in case I ever got desperate? You can put it in a gun, but it won't do anything. It will just blow up the gun when I try to use the gun. I don't know, because there's no gunpowder in it. Oh. There's nothing to blow up. Oh. Gun, guns aren't explosive on their own. I've, I've watched too many movies. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? You're a bunch of wise guys? Get on over to the old leather couch and watch the film noir classic... Criss Cross. Yeah, you'll get slapped and like it. It's so murky. Steve Thompson is having a passionate conversation with Anna. And they're worried about getting caught. They're discussing an upcoming caper that Steve is going to pull. After it's all over and we're safe, it'll be just you and me. She goes back inside to Slim Dundee, her husband. Where have you been? Outside. Just a minute. What do you mean outside? I wanted to step outside for a not smoke. Steve comes into the club where he runs into his old friend, Pete Ramirez. It's, Is that a shirt or a jacket? It looks like it's a jumpsuit, like it just came from a very fashionable gas station. You gotta stay out of here, man, or else trouble's gonna happen. You walk in there and two minutes later you'll start swinging. Swing dancing. You can't swing dance here. No, I let them punch their heads off. I give it up. I don't care anymore. 
cop not on the edge. He's a tight cannon. And Slim and Steve don't get along. In fact, they get into a knife fight. But it turns out their knife fight was staged so they could fool Lieutenant Ramirez. Steve and Slim are actually in cahoots. They're gonna rob the armored car together. Nobody ever got away with a heist on an armored truck in 28 years. He just loaded Chekhov's gun. Yep. The next morning, Steve shows up to work at the armored car company with his buddy Pop. I'm worried about that phone call. Tell you the truth, I don't like the smell of the whole thing. After it's done, and after it's all over, you must say. It'll be just you and me. Steve, well, who's the woman that's in the car with us? <laughs> but first, a flashback. It's okay, don't worry. We haven't gone back in time. Oh. Only the movie has. <laughs> okay. Steve returns to his old hometown after being gone for a while. Where's Mom and Slay? I'm going window shopping again? Or is she out gabbing with the neighbors? Which is it, huh? Rabbing with the neighbors. <laughs> and he runs into Anna. Anna turns out to be his ex-wife. <laughs> Tony Curtis! Oh, yeah, there he is. Kept that hairstyle until 1995. <laughs> I'm gonna get my revenge on that Tony Curtis kid for dancing with my broad. I'm gonna make him into my lap dog someday when I'm a high-powered gossip columnist. <laughs> Does the old crowd still come in here? Lots of people come in here night times. Depends on which old crowd you meet. The actor playing that bartender, he should only play magical creatures like hobbits and leprechauns. <laughs> He seems to be suited for that perfectly. <laughs> She's dating a slick-looking character named Slim. But despite this, it seems like Anna and Steve are gonna rekindle their old romance. He asks her out on a date, but she stands him up and instead goes to Yuma and marries Slim. What the hell? Tramp. Cheap, little, no-good tramp. Steve mopes around for a few months. I'm perfectly all right, Frank. Nothing for you to worry about. Would you like to take a trip to the magical fairy realm? Right. Say. What do you think you're doing? I was casting a spell. <laughs> His old buddy, Lieutenant Ramirez, told Anna to get out of town because Anna is no good. And yet these two lovebirds can't keep their paws off each other. Slim shows up at the house with a thug and a guy who is very pasty-faced. Why don't you come down and join us? Mike White's first screen appearance. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, no, no, no. What I'm actually doing is trying to convince her to convince you to go in on a heist with me. It can't be done. You know it can't be done. It can be done. How? If you have an inside man. They start hatching the plot, and they get their gang of characters together, including a drunken old fancy pants named Finsley. Finsley? Gee whiz, I thought he was dead. This is the best actor you could get. <laughs> I think he's a mathematician or something. Finsley tells him exactly how you could actually pull off robbing an armored car. Take these cigarette butts off the table. Can't stand the stink of them. He shouldn't have showed up in a film noir. And the movie becomes really fascinating because you really want to know who this Finsley guy is. But you never really find out. Back in the present, Steve is driving the armored car. And Pop is still all worried because things are not exactly how they should be. They get to their destination, they come out of the car with the bags of money, and the crime starts happening. Smoke starts exploding everywhere. There's a milkman with exploding milk bottles. Oh, it's chaos. Pop is shot and he dies. Steve is double-crossing everyone. He's going to actually kill all the gangsters and get away with the money, well that doesn't work because Steve gets shot. Waking up in the hospital, he finds himself to be a hero in the local papers. Steve Thompson, now in the Angel of Mercy Hospital. That is where you can find him. He's immobile <laughs> and no one is guarding him. Steve is pretty nervous there in the hospital, all incapacitated, he's got his arm uh, up like that. And he gets all nervous and paranoid. Ransom suspense. <laughs> and he asks the nurse who the guy in the hallway is, and she says, oh, that's just Mr. So-and-so. I don't remember his name. His name is Nelson. Mm -hmm. He comes in and keeps Steve company for a while. I want somebody to be with me, to stay with me. Would you do that for me, please? Will you take a bullet for me, please? Possibly multiple bullets? Can you do I... that for me, pal? But that guy is working for Slim, too. He cuts Steve loose from his hangings, and he puts him in a car, and he's going to take him to Slim. Take me where I want to go and I'll give you 10,000. 10 grand. Steve convinces the man to not take him to Slim, but rather take him up to meet Anna. He pays off the man, and Anna and Steve are together again. Finally, they can run off. 
But it turns out she's only in it for the money, not in it for the Steve. Why did you have to come here in the first place? Why? Why? It was all working out. Steve's in it only for Anna. I never wanted the money. I just wanted you. You have to watch out for yourself. Slim pulls up with a gun and he shoots and kills both of them. They die in each other's arms. The cops show up. Nobody wins. The end. That's the ending? Jesus. <laughs> Crisscross. The most cynical noir movie ever made. It is pretty cynical. I certainly wasn't expecting that ending. The ending had to go that way because at the time, due to the Hays Code, no yep. one would be allowed to get away. Mm -hmm. But you, they don't necessarily have to be gunned down. No, no. Obviously, Steve was not a hero. No. Does he even qualify as a protagonist? <laughs> He gets backed into doing everything he has to do in that movie. He's sort of a chump. And I don't know where the plotting started. Oh, this guy works for an armored truck company. You used to be married to him. Why don't we try to get his goat? Like, do you think Anna was in on it the entire time? I, I think so. Maybe the whole Anna finding him after he comes back and rekindling that romance, maybe that was a, you know, was this big long con from Slim to rob the armored car company. But it is Steve who speaks the idea. I'm sure that Slim was building towards that. Yeah. There's a lot of chess being played in this movie, and Steve is not good at playing chess. No, he's, he's not. Is there a protagonist? The protagonist is a person who pushes the plot along. Okay. To its ends, uh, whether good or bad. I... And the antagonist is the one who tries to stop that motion? Yeah. Okay. And the villain can be the protagonist of the movie. Sure. It's said that Hans Gruber is actually the protagonist of Die Hard because he's the one causing the action. Oh, that's interesting. While John McClane is the antagonist because he's the guy who keeps getting in the way. Steve is the antagonist because he foils the plot. Yeah, but he's not very good at it. He even fails as a dramatic device. Oh, that palooka. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when we drew this genre last time, uh, you signed off with, Good night, and no good deed will go unpunished. Were there any good deeds in this movie, and how were they punished? Pete, the cop, he does a good deed by telling Anna to buzz off. I suppose the punishment for him would be that they got they got together anyway. Yeah. And it was a disaster. Looking at this movie as a film noir, you have the gangster, the femme fatale, the schmuck. How do you think they did as far as those three roles go? I think they did pretty well because I didn't really see Anna as a femme fatale until late in the movie. Yeah. I mean, I think she played it really straight. She really has an innocence and a, an earnestness that doesn't tip the hat to what she turns out to be at the end of the movie. Yeah. So she, I think she did a great job. How do you like Slim as a gangster? Well, I, I love Dan Dernier. It was, it was great to see him in this movie. He's just got that really psychotic demeanor about him. This guy could explode at any second and do something crazy. See, but the thing is, I didn't have that feeling from him in the movie. There was never a feeling of danger when he was around. I really did get the sense, and it was from the strength, from the presence of that actor, that he was, you know, capable of being a badass gangster. I would have liked to see more with that gang of kooky characters. I found the mechanics of it really intriguing when Finsley was figuring it all out. What are they going to do? It's like, oh, well, they need the oil truck, they need the ice cream truck, and none of it is used. Right, It's, it's right. weird because the heist just kind of doesn't happen. But the person I really want to know more about is that Finsley guy. Who <laughs> was he? You know, it's like, he needs to have his own... He deserves life. his own movie. Maybe there's a whole slew of stories in which he just comes in in one scene. Yeah, he's just... like a drunk Winston Wolf. Or, uh, yeah. He he's just... the guy they bring in, yeah. give him a bottle of whiskey, and he'll plan your robbery for you, and then he'll go back to his flea bag hotel. And... Yeah, play chess with himself. We have to write that screenplay. <laughs> Surely there's a, there's a modern actor who can play Finsley. <laughs> the Finsley Chronicles. It has to be like Gary Oldman. Gary like, Oldman! Yeah. That's it. I think if this movie had a one word theme, I would say that it's hopelessness. <laughs> what do you think about that? Why do you say that? Why because do you use that everybody's word? ambitions amount to nothing. Everyone loses. Everyone's good intentions go nowhere. Even the cop. Even the uh, bartender. <laughs> <laughs> Did you expect anything more? You don't go into film noir hoping to walk out singing a song. You go in to watch horrible things happen to horrible people in really fun ways. Or doomed losers. Yeah. Steve Thompson is not a bad guy. But usually in film noir, there'll be someone who has a code, and he breaks the code, and that's why he loses. Steve doesn't even know what his code is until it's told to him by Anna at the end of the movie. She, she says that to, to make it into the world, you always have to do what's best for yourself. 
But you're not like that, Steve. Steve has always been trying to help other p people, and then once he tries to help himself, that's when things fall apart for him. Huh. He goes against his code, and so nothing's going to work. Well, that was crisscross. I think I liked it a little better than Craig did. That's what happens when you see movies with someone else. Yeah, maybe you should watch this movie with your good friend and have a spirited discussion, and maybe you'll like it more than they do, and you'll be right. <laughs> Please feel free to check out our website, welcome to the basement show.com, and there is a PayPal donation fund you can donate to support this show. Hey, we need support, just like uh, a hapless mug who gets caught up in a, a web of a situation. Our recent donors include Gene, who says, Thanks so much for making a show that is as fun as it is clever. Tom, Patrick, who writes, Keep up the awesome work, Matt and company. MMF, Gornov, Jonathan, David, and Tito, who writes, Love your show. Can't get enough of it. Great movie commentary and discussion spiced with superior humor. From Finland with love. Thank you, all of you people. Nina Mulek writes on Facebook, I love watching the show. It's caused me to consider films very differently. I'm an animator, and observing film rather than just being entertained is valuable and enjoyable. Thanks for the clever overtones and insightful looks at some very important films. And Nina drew a cute little picture of the two of us. Oh, that's There nice. it is right there. If you've made some fan art of the show, uh, please feel free to post it on our Facebook page. Maybe we'll show it on a future episode. Dateless Wonders writes... Craig, I get your aversion to Ethan Hawke. I don't know where he came from or what he means. <laughs> what does he mean, Craig? Ethan Hawke is a fine actor, but he lacks all charm. I, I think the basic equation for a good actor is charming and vulnerable, and he's just all vulnerability and he's not charming. He thinks he's charming, but he's just smug. Who is an actor that is all charm and no vulnerability? Early George Clooney, but you can coast on that. You watch Ocean's Eleven, it's like, oh yeah, you can just... Smile at a bank vault and we'll open up for him. But later when he hits Solaris, Michael Clayton, you know, he can also bring out the real torment. So there you have it. That's why Craig doesn't like Ethan Hawke. The short version. And now, seen it. <sighs> seen it. Mathia, Mate, <clears throat> Mateus Fernandez on Facebook writes, Hello from Brazil. Love your show. And I'd like to ask you if you've ever seen the 1942 film To Be or Not To Be. Seen it. Seen it. I rewatched this movie when I, after I read your comment, just because I hadn't seen it in a long time, and wow, is that a good movie. Do they really call me Concentration Camp Earhart? <laughs> <laughs> that was by Ernst Lubitsch, and, you know, there's only a handful of films that were made during the war, that were about the war, that really address kind of the human cost of, of World War II, and not get into, like, jingoistic, flag-waving territory. Casablanca is one of them. Chaplin's The Great Dictator is one of them. And To Be or Not To Be definitely is one of them. Yeah, you may not think it would come from that because it's a comedy, but there's the scene where the Jewish actor gives the Shylock speech to the Nazis, and it's gorgeous. It is a really well-done comedy, and then it turns on a dime and becomes an espionage thriller. And it's just as good as both types of movie. Counter Nerd asks, have you seen Down by Law? I'd be very happy to hear your opinions on it. I see, you see, we all see, for I see. Knit. <laughs> seen it. It threw me off the first time I saw it because I rented it from, and it was in the comedy section, and like the first half hour of the movie That's isn't like funny. Comedy for weird people. Yeah. yeah. As soon as Roberto Benigni shows up, it becomes hysterical. Roar! Ruar writes, Hey guys, love the show. Have you seen the black comedy Bernie? It's very successful at putting the viewers in the shoes of the people of Carthage, Texas, and shows that Jack Black is a great actor if given the right role. Seen it. Seen it. This is a Richard Linklater movie, and I think this is the perfect type of movie for him to do. Linklater, like Kevin Smith, does not have a gift for great dialogue. I think his dialogue is there to sort of put ideas across rather than to have characters kind of organically interact with each other. It comes off as a little false. But in this movie, it seems like the real-life people of Carthage, Texas are being interviewed, and so it makes it all seem very real. This might be the performance of Jack Black's career. He should have been nominated for an Oscar and lost to Daniel Day-Lewis, just like everyone else. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Ox Bigley, 2010... Asks, what about Stranger Than Fiction? I thought it was going to suck because it was a Will, Will Ferrell film, but is a great overlooked film. Seen it. Seen it. I was not crazy about Stranger Than Fiction. Oh, I was madly in love with that movie. Still am. I found it really, really touching. It's, it's all about a man 
accepting his own death, which is the hardest thing for everyone to do. Was Maggie Gyllenhaal in this? Yeah. And she plays the kooky, like, mm-hmm. baker? Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't stand her. You couldn't stand her? That was the whole pixie dream girl thing. Okay, I know that she's going to teach him to loosen up. No, yeah. he forces himself to loosen up so he can attain her. He has to work to get her. I think the movie lost me early and it never got me back. Ah, well. But, you know, I couldn't really tell you much about it, so it obviously didn't leave much of an impression, so what do I know? Slice of Gold writes, You dudes should watch Tokyo Drifter. Seen it. Seen it. This is a Sejun Suzuki film from Mary old Japan, one of the most unique gunman gangster movies you'll ever see. The way that he uses color is revolutionary. And there's a musical number where the main characters just start singing. Yeah. The gun battle, this is not a spoiler, the gun battle at the end of the film, one of the most unique gun battles you'll ever see in your life. That last gun battle was a dance, basically. Mm-hmm. It was yeah. just gorgeous to watch. Well, that's seen it, and that's our show. Thanks so much for joining us. And it's time for Craig to pick the genre of the movie we're going to watch in our next episode. I've got the remaining envelopes here. We're only going to pick two more of these. Yeah, mix them around, mix them around. There we go. That one there. Letter opened. Outlaw Biker! <laughs> All right, well, rev up your engines and join us next time when we'll be watching an outlaw biker movie. Check out welcometothebasementshow.com and good night. I know, but compare. Soap powder, 43 cents on the telephone. At the Great Western Market, 37 cents. And some stores have soap that's not in powder form. Tramp. Cheap little no-good tramp.